Mark 2, 13 through 17. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Thanks for that reading, Mike, and in just a moment I'll introduce the guest speaker who's going to be sharing that text with us and uh, challenging our, our hearts and encouraging our minds and strengthening our faith with what's recorded in, in that text. There's a text in John chapter 5, the first few verses, that describes Jesus at the pool of Bethesda and describes the people who were brought there in, in hopes of getting into the water. At the end of verse 3 and end of verse 4, um, there, there's a segment that is disputed as to whether it's original to John's gospel. I'm not preaching today, but you know I can't let a Sunday pass without discussing a textual variant. So I just wanted to, to mention that what that textual variant says is that it was a common belief that an angel would come down and stir the waters and whoever got in first would, would be healed. And it goes on to describe Jesus healing a man who had been sick for 38 years. And those of you who have not yet lived 38 years, just think about being sick that entire period of time. But that, that concept of the stirring of the waters is one that really resonates with me uh, from Scripture. And it, it's somewhat disturbing when these waters lie still for a while. And then it's really exciting when those waters are stirred again as hearts are devoted to Jesus Christ, as commitments are made, as faith in Jesus Christ is confessed, and upon their faith in Jesus Christ, people are immersed in his name, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Holy Spirit, for the forgiveness of their sins, to be added to the kingdom of God. Uh, last Sunday afternoon, Quentin Koniger was baptized into Jesus Christ, uh, by his grandfather, Glenn Lyle. On Monday morning, Matt Doss, who is Sue's grandson, and Stephanie and Corey's nephew, I believe they attended Open Door. Uh, Matt was baptized into Jesus Christ. Early on Monday afternoon, Reagan Edison was baptized uh, into Jesus Christ by her father, David. And then a little later in the afternoon, Kelsey Smith was baptized into Jesus Christ. And I love it when the waters are stirred. And when hearts are stirred that, that lead them to obedience in Jesus Christ. I know Matt and his family may be at Open Door this morning, but if he's here, would you stand? And Quentin and Kelsey and Reagan, would you guys stand for just a second and let everybody see who and where you are so they can express their love for you and uh, commend you in your faith? We are blessed today to have Brady Ross with us as a guest speaker. Uh, we met the Ross family in 2003 when they moved from the Nashville area to Frisco, Texas. Uh, we were still a fairly young church plant at McDermott Road at that time, and it was so great to have such a wonderful young family join us. Bobby was serving at the time as a religion writer for the Associated Press. He got transferred from the Nashville Bureau to the Dallas Bureau. And he and his wife, Tammy, and children, Brady, who was 10 at the time, he was the oldest of the three, uh, Brady and Keaton and Kendall, uh, I think she was four when they moved there because Kim and I had her in the four-year-old class at maybe that, that first uh, quarter they were there. But sadly, they left us uh, in 2005 to move to Edmond where Bobby took on the responsibilities of managing editor of the Christian Chronicle, a role that he continued in until recently. He's now serving as a special correspondent for the Chronicle. Tammy, his wife, served as online editor and, and in their other functions for a long time. And it's been nice to be close to them again, relatively speaking, and to have been able to, to catch up with them, and then to see the amazing way that their children have grown. Uh, I used to be significantly taller than Brady when I first met him. Uh, that is no longer true. Brady is a junior preaching major at Oklahoma Christian. He has uh, spent the last two summers working with the MacArthur Park Church 
in San Antonio, Texas uh, during the summer working with their youth. This semester he's working as an intern with the youth at the Edmund Church of Christ. Are you going to Naperville this summer? He's going to the Naperville Church of Christ outside Chicago this summer. He's made mission trips to Honduras and Mexico. He's planning on doing the study abroad program in the fall. And we're just extremely proud of this young man, as I know his parents are, and a lot of other people in his family are. But we're just grateful to be able to have Bobby and, and Brady with us, to have Brady share this message with us. And I'll ask you to come on up, and we'll have a prayer together, and then turn it over to you. Welcome. Almighty Father, we thank you so much for the love that you have for us, the grace that you have extended to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the salvation that that brings us, uh, for the new birth that uh, Quentin and Kelsey and, and Matt and Reagan have experienced this past week. Father, we thank you for the family that makes us a part of, that stretches around the globe. And Father, I thank you for uh, my younger brother, Brady, Thank you for his heart for you, his desire to serve in ministry, for the gifts that you have given him, for the preparation that he has made in, in sharing your word with us this morning. And Father, may we listen through him to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. On? There I am. Perfect. Hey, it is so great to be here this morning. I'm so excited to get the chance to speak to you. Tim, thank you for that great introduction. I was hoping you wouldn't talk me up too much, and I think we're borderline close right now. So hopefully you're not disappointed as I start talking. Well, today I want to tell you a story. And as I start to tell you this story, I want to do it in a way that is hopefully a little different from what you're used to. The more I speak, the more I learn that my greatest desire as a speaker is to speak sermons that people haven't heard before. I don't want to get up and speak a sermon that you've heard a thousand times before. I want to approach the text in a new way, a fresh way, a way that has really spoken to my heart. And so I'm going to try to do that this morning with the help of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you this story, and I want to tell it to you in a way that's different. I want to start at the end and then work our way back to the beginning and show you how we get to the end. I want to show you that it's not just the end of the story that's important, but it's the journey that you take to get to the end of that story. I tried this earlier on this past year. I guess it was last year now. It's 2014 now. It's weird whenever the calendar changes. It was last summer in 2013. I was in San Antonio. I was working with the MacArthur Park Church of Christ, and they were gracious enough to let me speak on two Sunday nights for their entire congregation. I'm a preaching ministry major. I'm also a youth ministry minor. I have interest in both different areas of ministry, but even while working with the youth group, it was great to get a chance to also do some preaching. So it was, the, it was the night after the 4th of July. I had just gone up to Dallas, Texas to visit with my family. I had flown there, flown back. Very quick flight. And I had an interesting experience on this flight. This flight coming back to San Antonio from Dallas. And as I was beginning this sermon, I got up to tell the congregation about this experience on this flight that I had had. And keeping true to this idea of starting at the beginning, well, starting at the end, excuse me, starting at the end and going back to the beginning, I get up, and the first thing that I say to them is, well, I almost died yesterday. And you can imagine that right away I have their atten attention, which is what I was going for. I say, so I almost died yesterday. And I go on to tell them how I was on this flight coming from Dallas to San Antonio, which, as you can imagine, especially if you've taken this flight before, it's a very short flight. It was only scheduled to be about an hour long. And even then, I was surprised when, after about 35 minutes of being in the air, they told us that we were starting to descend, and we were starting to get very close to the ground. And this flight had been a little bumpy up until this point. There had been some turbulence. So I was already a little concerned, and I began to grow even more concerned as we drew closer to the ground, and I didn't see anything that looked familiar to me. I had spent about five months of my life in San Antonio before this point. I had worked there the summer before. I had spent the first month and a half of this previous summer there. So as we're getting closer to the ground, and as I'm starting to worry about whether or not we're actually getting closer to the airport, I'm starting to look around for anything that might look familiar to me. I'm looking for my house. I'm looking for the church, 
looking for the Alamo. I'm looking for the Tower of Americas, which is a 50-foot tall store, 50 story tall building there in San Antonio. I'm looking for all of this, and I'm not seeing anything that looks familiar to me. So maybe I'm just being paranoid, but I begin to get this idea in my head that we are not to San Antonio yet, that we're about to crash, we're about to die, and they don't want to tell us because they want the last few minutes of our lives to be enjoyable. <laughs> and then about five minutes later, we're on the ground, I'm getting off of the plane, walking into the airport, feeling like the biggest idiot in the world. Maybe I was a little paranoid then, maybe I wasn't. But through that experience and through telling that story, I realized that it is interesting to look at a story from that perspective. To start at the end, to work our way back to the beginning, and to show the journey that it takes to get from the beginning to the end. With that in mind, I want us to experience, through we, as we go through the story today, I don't want us to only experience the end, I want us to experience the journey as well which will be easy for us in this story, I think, because I imagine this is a story that most of us know very well. If you've grown up in the church, these stories in the gospel are stories that you have grown up hearing. So it's my hope today that we begin to get a new perspective on this story, and not just on the end of this story, but on the journey of this story as well. So as we look at this story, we'll be in Mark chapter 2 today. We've read this text already once before this morning, we're going to look through it again now. I want to start in verse 17, which obviously is the end of our story. It says, On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have, come, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So we approach Jesus, and Jesus is with sinners, with tax collectors. He is not only with them, but he is in their house, and he is having dinner with them. The Pharisees look on and they see this and they wonder why Jesus would do such a thing, to which Jesus replies, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, I have come to call sinners. And the Pharisees are left shaking their heads in confusion. We don't see anything else that they say as a part of this exchange here. So that must be where we're going. Now the question begins to be, how did we get there? Let me pull this text up on here. There's my PowerPoint. So this is the beginning of our story. It says, Once again Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. So even in this initial beginning of the story, I'm already drawn into this text. I'm very interested in what it's saying. So Jesus goes by the lake, and right away he attracts a crowd. He's got a large group of people that are coming there, they're coming to listen to him. They want to hear what he has to say. And he teaches them for a while, but then he leaves them behind. He leaves them behind, and he goes, and he reaches out to this guy that's probably off to the side by himself. This guy named Levi, sitting at the tax collector's booth. This crowd that he was speaking to before, most, if not all of them, had come that day to hear Jesus speak. They had seen Jesus there. They had heard that he was going to be there and speaking, and they wanted to go hear what he had to say. So they approach him, and they listen to him, but that's not what Levi was doing. Levi was a tax collector. He had a booth there by where Jesus was. He didn't come to listen to Jesus. He had come to do his job. He was at work for the day. That doesn't stop Jesus, though. Jesus doesn't care how Levi got there. He still leaves that crowd behind, and he goes, and he approaches him. He asked Levi to follow him. Jesus leaves the people who have approached him to go and to approach somebody else. And this is important for a few reasons. First of all, who is this somebody else? Who is Levi? Well, we know from our text, because Mark tells us, we know that Levi is a tax collector, which in this culture at this time means that he's a traitor. You see, people didn't have the highest opinion of tax collectors at the time. Tax collectors were typically Jews who were stealing money from other Jews to support the Roman government, which at the time was lording over the Jews. The Jews were in submission to the Roman government, and to be a tax collector meant that you were a Jew, and you were trying to support yourself, trying to make money, and you were trying to stay on the Romans' good side, so you worked for them and took advantage of your fellow Jews, your brothers and sisters that were Jews. 
And as most of us know, oftentimes they would take more money than they were supposed to. Not the greatest people around, maybe your hot and spicy pickles of the day, if that's the terminology you want to use. So Jesus leaves this crowd that has approached him, that came to hear him speak, and instead he goes to talk to this tax collector. And even though he leaves the crowd, that doesn't mean the crowd leaves him. The crowd is still there looking on, watching him as he leaves them to approach this tax collector. This crowd sees Jesus reaching out to Levi, and they aren't the only ones who see this. You see, in this story, there are three groups that see Jesus doing what he is doing. There are three groups that witness Jesus reaching out to this tax collector, and later on in our story, reaching out to these sinners. There are three groups who experience this, three groups who are a part of this, And I think we can learn from looking at what each group sees and what each group watches. And this first group is the crowd. And one of my first questions as I think about this story is, what would Jesus have been teaching about on this day? I love looking at the stories in the gospel as they relate to each other. As you look at one story and then see how it relates to the next. Because something that I've learned about Jesus is that Jesus is great at providing his own object lessons. Keep in mind that Jesus isn't neglecting the crowd entirely. He sees them, he welcomes them, he teaches them for a while, and then afterwards is when he goes to reach out to Levi, probably with the intention that the crowd would see him doing that. And I wonder if this tied into whatever he would have been talking about that day. I wonder if he wanted to teach the crowd that the kingdom of God was open to anybody. We'll come back to this idea a little later. For right now, let's go ahead and look at verse 15. This is the second group. This is our disciples and our sinners that come together and eat together. Verse 15, it says, While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Now, if you think that crowd was surprised to see Jesus leave them and go approach a tax collector, imagine how the disciples must have felt after they found out what Jesus was doing. They probably had the same reservations that the people in the crowd had. The same harsh feelings towards tax collectors. The same uneasy feeling whenever Jesus approaches him and starts talking to him, asking him to be a follower. Wait, what? He's going to be a follower? If I'm a disciple, I'm thinking, well, now I have to hang out with this guy all the time. Now this guy is going to be in the inner circle just like I am. This guy is going to be one of us. This would probably be one of those times where Peter would pull Jesus aside and say, wait, Jesus, are you sure you really want to do this? Are you sure this is smart? I know you haven't been around here a very long time, but do you know who that guy is? Do you know what this guy does to us? Whose side this guy is on? Are you sure this is smart, Jesus? But there is no change in Jesus' mind at this point. Not only is he inviting Levi in, not only is he calling Levi to be a follower, but he's even going into Levi's house. He's going to eat with him and all of his tax collector friends and all of his sinner friends. They're having this meal together. And in this context, saying that he's eating with sinners is important. I know a lot of us will see that, and I even had this thought initially. I saw that he was eating with sinners, and I thought, well, that's not a huge deal, right? I mean, in one way or another, we're all sinners. We all need the grace of God. We're all baptized so that we can be forgiven of our sins. We're all sinners in one way or another. And that might be true, but I know that in this context, they didn't see somebody to be a sinner because of that. They saw sinners, and they saw somebody who knowingly and willfully violated the law of God on a regular basis. And how could Jesus eat with people like that, especially in this day and age where eating with somebody was a sign that you accepted them, that you were welcoming them? How could Jesus openly and willingly accept sinners? That question is tough to answer, but the fact of the matter is that he is accepting them. He is welcoming them. And the disciples that are with him, the disciples that go into Levi's house with him are a part of that as well. They're seeing and experiencing the same thing that Jesus is. They are witnesses of what he is doing on this day. They're in Levi's house, sitting at Levi's table, 
eating Levi's food with all of these other technically unclean people. They're seeing all of these same things. There's somebody else that's seeing this too, and they're a little quicker to say that they don't like it. You see, as far as we know, the disciples are quiet in this story. They're not voicing their concerns, voicing their opinions. They just go along with what Jesus does. They might have been thinking these things, but as far as we know, they didn't come out and say them. But there was somebody that did. Our third audience is the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they were always looking for a way to trap Jesus, looking for something they could do to frame Jesus. And they see him eating with tax collectors and sinners, and they think, hey, this is our chance. And they jump all over that. I want to also take just a second before we get into this text right here to note that nobody knows exactly who Jesus is yet. It's easy for us to be critical of the Pharisees and critical of the disciples in these stories in the gospel because we know who Jesus is. We know that Jesus came as the Messiah and came and died on the cross and that he was the incarnate Son of God. But they do not know this. It's a major theme in the book of Mark. As our plot develops, we, we begin to see exactly who Jesus is. And it's not until Mark 7 that we realize, oh yeah, Jesus is in fact the Messiah. Peter confesses it in Mark chapter 7. But right now we're in chapter 2. Nobody knows exactly who Jesus is yet. What we do know is that he's a leader. He's grown up and lived according to Jewish customs at this point. He's beginning to teach the Jews. Jews are beginning to follow him. And people are starting to respect him. But at the same time, eating with tax collectors and sinners like he's doing in this story is a violation of all of their laws and all of their customs that they've held. Jews didn't associate with non-Jews in that way. For Jesus to do this, it's almost an insult to their religion. It's a slap in the face to their customs. The Pharisees knew this, and they jumped all over it. At a time like this, when people are starting to pay less attention to them and more attention to Jesus, they couldn't help themselves. They thought, hey, maybe this is our chance. And so they speak up, wondering why Jesus would do such a thing. Verse 16, when the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners. Imagine the Pharisees were pretty silent after this point. After all, what else could they say? Up until this point in the story, Jesus is the one who looks like the crazy one. He's the one who leaves the crowd to approach the one. He is the one who goes into the tax collector's house and brings his disciples with him. He is the one that is eating with them, that is showing that he accepts them, that he is welcoming them. And then after one simple analogy, it's not Jesus that looks crazy anymore. It's all of the other people in the story. They look crazy for not seeing what Jesus sees and for not doing what he does. Jesus speaks to three different audiences, yet he gives them all the same simple message. The Son of Man, that's not it. Sorry. You got a little teaser there of what I'm going to talk about next. He gives them all this very simple message. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And from this, we get two simple yet very important and essential takeaways. That one, which you just saw because of my mistake, the lost don't always have to be lost. I love the way that Jesus goes about breaking down barriers in the gospel. I look at what Jesus does, and I look at the people that Jesus spent time with, the people that he considered friends, and I doubt that Jesus ever felt awkward. After all, you look at some of the situations that he went into, situations like this one where he's eating in a tax collector's house. He is Jesus. He is the Son of God. He is holy. He is sacred. Yet he is associating with people who, by our definition, are knowingly and willfully violating the law of God on a regular basis. And that's just the story we're looking at today. We've got four books full of crazy things that Jesus does, and I'm sure that if he ever felt awkward, he didn't let it show. He was opening, he was welcoming in all situations. He welcomed in anybody, knowing that it was the lost people, the sick people, that needed him more than anybody. He knew he could help them find what they were looking for. He knew that the lost 
didn't always have to be lost. Jesus met and he ate with these lost people, accepting them even though they had problems and even though they might have been lost. And when people criticized him for it, like the Pharisees do in this story, he reminds them that it's those lost people that he came for. He didn't come to call the righteous people. He came to call the sinners and the tax collectors and the people who had demons inside of them. He was not there for the healthy, but he was there for the sick. And that's our second takeaway. Jesus accepts sinners while recognizing that they need to be healed. I worry that sometimes in our society we confuse being accepting with being tolerant. We think that Jesus will tolerate our sin because he accepts us in spite of it. And I don't think that's entirely true. Jesus accepts us, but he does not accept our sin. He's a great example of loving the sinner and hating the sin. Jesus will welcome us in regardless of the baggage that we bring with us, but he demands that we put that baggage down and pick up a cross instead. Levi wasn't going to get to follow Jesus some days and sit at the tax collector's booth whenever he wasn't following Jesus. It was all or nothing. And the cool thing about this story is that Levi did give up everything, and he did follow Jesus. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the guy's name down here that did story time earlier, but he kind of hinted at what I'm about to talk about. This guy gets a new name, and it's a proclamation of just how much his life was transformed. You see, a lot of us know this guy as Levi, but some of us also know this guy as Matthew. In fact, in Matthew's parallel, which is in Matthew chapter 9, it's the same story that's being told, but our character is not Levi, our character is Matthew. And as we study the Bible, and as we study the historical context of the Bible, we believe that Levi's name was changed to Matthew later on. And if that's true, then this same guy who was once a tax collector, once a sinner, and once associated with people that were just like him, he is now Matthew. He is now a disciple. He is now somebody that wrote one of our four accounts of the gospel. The lost don't always have to be lost. They might be sick and they might need a doctor, but through the life that Jesus lived and through the death that Jesus died, he shows us without a doubt that real transformation like this is possible. You don't always have to sit at a tax collector's booth and wonder if that's all that life has to offer you because transformation is a real thing. There's this island in Japan, it's called the island of Okunoshima. Okunoshima back during World War II was home to two different factories. It was home to a poison gas testing factory facility. You can use whatever word you want to call it. A poison gas testing facility. And it was also home to a chemical weapon factory. They were getting these weapons ready to use in the war. And as a part of this, they brought thousands of bunny rabbits over to this island of Okunoshima. And they were bringing the rabbits over to test these poisonous gases on to make sure that they were just deadly enough to be used in war, to be used to cause mass destruction. Not the greatest place in the world, as you can imagine. This picture I'm showing you right now is a picture of the poison gas testing facility. Still stands today on Okunoshima. You can still go visit it if you're inclined to. Um, I think I have a picture next. We'll see if it's up here in just a second. But as you can see, as you look at this picture, this place is a little run down now. They're probably not doing a whole lot of poison gas testing here now. And there's a reason for that. After the war was over, they closed these factories down, they released all of the bunnies, and now Okunoshima is known for a different reason. Okunoshima is now known as Bunny Island. They released all of these bunnies that they were testing out the gases and the weapons on, and as life goes, they bred, they made more bunnies. And now Okunoshima is home to hundreds of thousands of bunny rabbits. I think I have another picture up there. Yes, yes I like that. Transformation is a real possibility. You see, people, when they think of Okunoshima now, they don't think about the poisonous gas. They don't think about the chemical weapons that were once formed and once tested there. It's all a part of the past. Now when you think about Okunoshima, you think about 
the bunny rabbits. You think about Bunny Island. Okunoshima is a reminder to me that even in the worst of situations, even when there seems to be no hope, transformation is still possible. Hope exists in every situation. For every tax collector, for every sinner, for every hot and spicy pickle, and for every poisonous gas testing facility, for every situation in life, the darkest, the most dire, the situations that seem hopeless, we have a Lord that offers us hope in everything. I titled this sermon, Catch the Fever, for two reasons. I think it's indicative of something old, but that's not what I want you to take away from this morning's lesson. I want you to remember it because of something new. You see, in the past, in Bible times, in the story that we just read, a lot of Jews would choose not to hang out with tax collectors and sinners because they were worried that they would catch the same diseases and the same problems that those people had. They separated themselves with the hope that they would stay clean while everybody else stayed unclean. They didn't want those other people to bring them down to their level. That's why they had so many laws. That's why they couldn't eat without washing their hands. That's why they couldn't touch certain foods. They wanted to stay clean. And staying clean meant not associating with anybody who was unclean. But that's not what I want you to think about when you think about catching the fever. Instead, I want you to think about catching the fever that Jesus had, following the pattern that he set. Catching that fever that Jesus has and that he shows us through the gospel of breaking down barriers and reaching out to those lost people, reaching out to the hot and spicy pickles of our world. Just like a fever, it's contagious and it has the potential to spread if more and more of us will start living in this way. It seems crazy at first. I understand that. There's a lot of people that we don't want to associate with. But once you start doing it, and once people see the impact that that can have, they'll begin to realize that you're not the crazy one. Instead, they are the crazy ones for not living in the same way that you are. After all, it worked in Jesus' time, so why can't it work today? What could happen for us in the world today if we began to truly look at people through Jesus' eyes? There might be people who are sick and that need healing. There might be people that we don't want to be around. But if we're so afraid of catching what they have that we choose not to go near them, how will they ever experience the gospel? How will the lost ever be found? It's our job as people who are found to help those people who are lost. Crazy transformation can happen. I think Okunoshima is proof of that. That only happens when the gospel is available. And it really can heal the sick. I'm sure you have stories about what the gospel has done either for you or for somebody else. If you don't, come talk to me afterwards. I can tell you stories. But having stories isn't good enough. Knowing what the gospel has done is not good enough. Instead, we need to write more stories. We need to continue on with the pattern and with the example that Jesus has left for us. Crazy transformation is possible, but only if the gospel is at the center of it. And with the gospel, we have a chance to continue on with the story. The rest of our life from here on out is a blank page. And it's up for you to fill that. It's up for you to write the next chapter. Maybe for you, writing the next chapter starts today. It was so encouraging before the lesson for me to hear about all of these people that have been baptized in the week before this. To hear about all of these people who have made the decision to center their lives around Jesus. I know for me that's been the most important and the greatest decision that I've made in my entire life. It changed everything for me. And maybe for you today, it's time for you to do just that. It's time for you to put down that baggage that you have been carrying and leave these sins at the foot of the cross, leave the tax collector's booth, and follow Jesus with everything you have. If that's where you're at today, if that's what you need to do, we would love to assist you in doing that. Maybe you have already been baptized. Maybe you were living for Jesus for a while, but these things started to bear down on you. Maybe you've been guilty of not reaching out to the lost in the world. Maybe you've been holding on to the gospel and keeping it for yourself. You don't always have to do that. 
transformation is possible. Whether you've already been transformed once or whether, whether you're ready to approach the waters of baptism for the first time. Wherever you may be today, whatever you need, I invite you to come forward. We would love to help you out as we stand and sing together.